Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin here. I'm a former medical doctor and learning coach, and today I'm gonna to be reviewing TikTok learning and productivity advice. <sighs> okay, let's go. And by the way, I have not watched any of these uh, yet. Your teacher announces the highest and lowest grades on the last exam. Somehow you got the highest. Here's what you did. So back in college, I tried this weird technique called blurting. I pulled out my notes the night before a huge biology exam and reviewed everything for 30 minutes. Then I put my notes away, took out a separate sheet of paper, and wrote down everything that I could remember. Once done, I used a different colored pen to write down everything I forgot, repeated this process, and used other tricks. Follow along. Um, so immediately, all right, Justin, start with the positive. Um, it's good that they're trying to share some, you know, study, study things that, that worked for them. The problem that I have is like, it's very, and obviously look, I get it. It's a TikTok, so it's really, really simplified. But the, the message that studying and studying well is a simple thing to do is harmful and you gotta recognize like this is my job like i'm every day working with people that have problems with their studying and when you hear a message saying like this is how you get the top mark like this is what you did it makes it seem like it's very simple to do this and so what that means is that if you do this technique and you still do not do well for the people that don't do well how they feel is even worse and so if you have like 50 of these videos and they're all saying this is what you do here's how to succeed this is what you need to do and it makes it seem so simple then the person that is using these techniques and not doing well they will then start believing that they are the problem but the thing is that techniques like these, it's not that they're not effective, it's that they are effective for a small percentage of people and those percentage of people are the people that already have probably naturally higher deep processing ability. Uh, essentially what they're talking about is very short term free recall and it's simply just stacked on top of each other. It's not a particularly sophisticated technique. It's gonna help you if the, like look, if the lowest grade was a five and the highest grade is a 97, this is not gonna take you from five to 97. If you're getting a five out of like a hundred. There are other problems at play here. There are probably issues with your conceptual understanding and this is not gonna help. This type of technique is what we'd call lower order. We know it's lower order because the information is considered in isolation. We can see that there's no evaluative comparative processes here. And so what we know is that if you are using a lower order method, then you're likely not gonna be able to get that higher order of thinking. You're not gonna have that higher order of mastery. Questions that ask you to compare, contrast, um, explain concepts a little bit more in depth in ways that aren't directly taught to you. So these are the curveball questions. These are the, one, these are the ones that you might get in you know, your senior years or in university. It's not gonna help you prepare for these ones. It will help you with basic recall and just being able to have recall of isolated information. And so if that's not the problem that you're struggling with, then this is not really going to help you very much. What this is talking about is it seems to be a variation of just free recall with brain dumping and then simply just stacked with a very, very short spacing interval. Will it help you if you are going from 93 to 97? Yeah, because those marks you missed might have been just those individual free recall, just fact recall related things. But if you're actually really struggling, this is not going to move the needle by that much. So yeah. All right, video number two. Like again, you know, these like really broad generalizations, like how to remember anything you study. It's the same problem that I talked about before about like how it's harmful to claim that learning is easy and simple and it's just like these little tips and tricks you can apply. That's not helping. Okay, so that's basically exactly the same thing. The best part about this, um, this technique is probably just the fact that you're reading through your notes very, very quickly. And this is gonna force you to create like a more basic, superficial, some people call them knowledge schemas, but it's basically just a, a very conceptual map of the main ideas. This is useful because it can help you create these knowledge anchors in place. Look, here's what I'll probably do that would make this a multi-order technique rather than purely just lower order. Because if, again, if you're not a deep processor inherently, this is not really gonna help you very much. Time yourself, but time yourself with a short interval. So 
So let's say that you're reading like maybe like one chapter of a textbook, you know, maybe like an entire week's worth of, of, of content that you're covering in class or a couple of weeks of content. Give yourself like 20, 25 minutes to go through and just figure out only the biggest key ideas. In fact, you can actually just type in like the main ideas and the learning objectives in like ChatGPT and you can just say like, what are the 10 most important concepts I need to know? in this to get a basic understanding of this topic. Spend the 25 minutes just focusing on a few important ideas and how those ideas relate to each other. By the end of the 25 minutes, if you can explain things, if you can remember definitions, you've done it wrong. You should only be able to say, these ideas seem to relate to this thing because it serves this purpose. Very, very general, fairly superficial, but very like broad and connected and networked. And that means that when you go over it again, you're gonna have lots more anchor points that make information relevant for your brain, which therefore makes it so that the, your memory becomes stickier because it's more relevant to begin with. And you can time yourself again, give yourself another 20 to 25 minutes. I wouldn't jump straight back into doing like a memory dump at this point because there's sort of no point. Your retention is gonna be so low and it's gonna be so lower order. You're only gonna be outputting in a linear isolated way. So if you've got gaps, in terms of conceptual gaps uh, and understanding how ideas connect with each other, you're not gonna reveal them from doing this and you're not gonna have that high of a retention anyway. And even if you do, because it's so immediately after, it's kind of pointless. Unless you're studying and then sending an exam like 10 minutes later, it's not really testing on anything. All this is doing is creating a generative effect of learning, but there are better ways to do a generative effect of learning rather than just doing this. So I would then give myself another 20, 30 minutes, go over the material again, and just pick up now on the things that were now relevant that weren't relevant the first time you read it. And you might pick up on like 10%, 15% more stuff than you had before. At this point, you might wanna now do a memory dump. And I wouldn't do a linear memory dump where I'm, you know, where you're just like writing everything down. I try to do a very basic mind map brain dump where I'm just trying to plot the main ideas and some of the concepts that seem to come from that. And you should have an overall skeleton of the information now. I would take that skeleton and then you can get your other color and then go through it again and start attaching information to your skeleton. And then you could cover that, come back the next day and then do a memory dump of everything you had there. That will be vastly more efficient. You're gonna be testing on multiple orders, higher order integrated thinking as well as lower order information recall it's fairly easy to do you know there's levels to this but you, you can get it fairly right the first attempt as long as you follow the instructions I just gave you and if you are really struggling this is gonna help you a ton more than just doing this technique alrighty let's uh let's try to move on to the next one here are five essential study tips that you're probably never taught. Number one, laughing. Rather than just passively rereading your textbook, highlighting your notes, which is amazing and easy and fun, which is why we all do it. That's you do completely correct. Tips, which is something called active recall. Active That's recall good. is hard. It is taking knowledge out of your brain instead of just rereading stuff. To do good something, so far. I'm going to choose something to remember. Let's do chapter one biology. I'm going to test myself on it. And I'm going to write down every single thing that I can remember from that chapter from memory. And I can use a few prompt words if I want from the chapter, but I'm just going to go ahead and write. Okay, so here's actually an interesting thing that I want to point out, which is that, okay, first of all, this person way better than the previous, previous people. Why? Because they are not saying this is the magic solution. Okay, and that already is great. Like, yes, it's more active. It's it's an active recall technique. It's better than the passive learning. That's absolutely correct. I don't disagree with anything that this person has said so far. They're not over promising it. They're not claiming it's more than it is. It's good. And the other thing that I want you to notice is I want you to look at the notes that they've written. They are not writing fully linear notes. They're actually writing what I would call mixed notes. And mixed notes is when you have linear as well as some kind of non-linear relational note taking. You often see mixed notes in people that don't have formal training in, in, in like note taking techniques, but they already have a level of deep processing. And that's what I was saying before is that this is a technique that's going to be really good if you already have high deep processing. But if you're struggling with the deep processing in itself, this is not going to help move the needle by too much for you because it's not your ability to just recall information. It's the actual level of understanding that's being reached in the first place. The number of connections and relationships that we're finding to begin with is at a different level. And that is something that this technique is not gonna help with. You know, So the, the previous technique that I talked about, that's one that I'd recommend instead. But if you look at the notes, you can already see that this person has, a, has some level of relational thinking. So it just goes to show. Get a highlighter and you compare it to your notes or your textbook. And 
But it seems like this blurting technique is... ...an efficient use of time. You now know what you need to work on more. I dare you to go try it for something you're trying to learn. My book with all my top study tips is coming out on the 5th of August. <laughs> Follow for study tip part two. Yeah, like just overall, you know, way better than the previous ones because it's not... It's not overselling it. Here's All right. the best way to study oh, for a like, test and make sure you ace it every single time. I hate it already. The best study method for any test. Who knew my whole job could be replaced with a 41 second TikTok? And make sure you ace it every single time. If you struggle with properly- Like I know it's just clickbait, but- many times and it works every single time. You're going to start by- Very linear, non-relational, lower order. It this seems like, test. like, has this person graduated university? Is this just high school? Like. You're going to start by grabbing your notes or your textbook and read everything. If it's a really big test and you have multiple units, I recommend doing this method unit by unit. Once you're done reading, you're going to grab a blank piece of paper. You so what you're going to do is something called blurting. Okay, so you shouldn't do it unit by unit. Even if you are using this, you shouldn't do it unit by unit. The reason that she's probably saying to do it unit by unit is because of the fact that it's going to be overwhelming to do it for big chapters, like more than one unit at a time. But the thing is that that's not actually useful. Well, I guess it depends on the definition of unit, but in in a lot of the curriculums that I am aware of, when like one unit is not completely separated from another unit, like there's actually they're actually related together. The reason that you shouldn't do it unit by unit is cr it creates false isolation of information. Information thrives when it exists in a network and when it's well integrated. So if you do it by like class by class or in this case unit by unit. There are very valuable, useful relationships that you could find that would make it easier, faster, more efficient, and improve your memory learning it with those relationships rather than forcibly isolating it, trying to remember it without having that re relevance, and then fighting against the fact that you're constantly trying to forget it. So that's not going to be good. Like, And also the, the note taking is, is like way too linear. It's very, very hard to represent higher order knowledge structures with linear note taking. Really the only people that can get away with linear note taking are people that have very good deep processing already or the assessments are really easy. I want you to think about your knowledge because knowledge does not exist in a linear format in our brain. Like anything you know well, it, it doesn't exist linearly. Like when you think about it, you're not thinking about it in terms of lines. And when you're recalling the information, you're, you're not recalling the information in lines. Like there is no part of human knowledge that inherently is just linear. And when you're writing your notes, you're meant to be trying to make a method of note taking that facilitates what's happening in your brain. Like your note taking should help the way that you think. And so linear note taking is actually doing it a disservice. It's going to make it harder to think. It's going to make it harder to find those relationships. True knowledge is closer to maybe a picture or a movie or, um, you know, like, uh, ah, you know what it's like? It's like those, um, you know, those like connect block things where you can connect all these plastic rods and things together to create like sculptures and shapes and it's, it's kind of like Lego in a way. That's closer to what knowledge is like. When you look at that, there isn't a start or an end point. You can start really anywhere and go anywhere else and there are pathways that you can take to get there. And now I want you to imagine, that's what knowledge is. Imagine trying to explain and write out all of those relationships in linear words. So just think about how time consuming and non viable that is. And we actually know this intuitively. If there's anything that you know, knowledge wise, if you were to try to teach someone else, you would not say the most effective way to teach this is to write a manual for everything that you know about this subject and then get the other person to just memorize the manual. Like already intuitively, you just know that that's not going to be an effective way for the other person to learn it, right? And so this is the reason why just generally speaking, linear methods of note taking and just doing things linearly in the lower orders does not scale and it does not work. So if you are struggling with studying, if you're really struggling, don't listen to this. You're going to grab a pen and then basically write down every single thing that you remember. Make sure not to grab a crayon. Just spend however much time you need to write down every single thing you remember. Once you're done, you're going to look for things that you missed. Then grab your notes again and repeat the process until yeah, you're done. Yeah, it's basically the exact same thing that everyone else is talking about. But already from there, it was like, nah. Like, you, you can just tell. The people that give advice like this are the people that have never actually really worked with someone. 
Like they've never really had someone that they are accountable for and they've had to give advice that they are accountable for to this person where their success actually matters. They don't have a position of responsibility and so they're just like giving this advice. It's like, oh, it worked for me. You know, oh, I'm just offering my perspective, whatever. But the thing is in the modern day when you've got a social media following, if you've got like 100,000 people following you, you are in a position of authority, right? You're an influencer. An influencer means you have influence on other people and that influence is in their thoughts and their beliefs and their actions. And your following is based on giving like study related advice. You have to hold yourself accountable because if you're not holding yourself accountable, there are legitimate negative effects. People are being harmed from this. That's just not cool. Like it's not just about, you know, you've got a cool little like TikTok or whatever it is that you're, you know, giving advice for. It's not enough just to say, I'm just giving my perspective. You have to have accountability because otherwise it causes harm. Imagine a doctor saying that, right? Imagine a doctor being like, I'm just giving my perspective. It's just my personal opinion about like what you should do with your health. We wouldn't tolerate that, right? There is no such thing as a doctor when it comes to, you know, like studying right now. Not what, well, like, well, not really. I mean, I guess that ends up being the position that I kind of filled. Honestly, the reason I filled that is because I just held myself accountable for the advice I give. Here's how to study when you really don't feel like studying. Guys, this hack helped me from getting nothing done to getting everything done. First step okay. is to go to the store and buy some treats. Now, every time you study for over 30 minutes, reward yourself with a treat. This is based off behavior psychology. It literally motivates you to start studying. Follow for more hacks. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's like <laughs> in 10 years from now, you can treat yourself with your insulin injection because you've got diabetes. No, but seriously, um, okay. So this is like, you know, pretty, pretty good advice in a way. There's a few things I'll probably say about this. So the behavior psychology that they're talking about is legitimate. Um, the way that she said it was like a bit like non-scientific, like <laughs> I've never heard a behavioral scientist be like behavioral psychology. Um, yeah, like all behavior is psychology. This is talking about the consequence aspect of behavior change and behavioral science. And uh, the consequence means that it's that, that a behavior is being reinforced and that reinforcement is positive or negative. If I do something and then I positively reinforce myself, like give myself a chocolate, then it creates like that little, you know, bit of a dopamine hit. I feel bitter about it and it creates a level of conditioning. So that can help to change behavior. But what modern research and really the focus on behavior change is moving away from uh, consequences and reinforcement because what we've found is that especially in older like older kids and adults consequences are much less of a driver of behavior change than the opposite which is the thing that comes before the behavior which is often called antecedents antecedents are the triggers that create a behavior in the first place as an example you could do this and you might be motivated to start studying but if you're in a bad mood if you haven't had a lot of sleep if you you know are surrounded by distractions it's probably still not going to be enough and it's very unsustainable in a way to constantly be rewarding yourself every time you do something and rely on that to be the behavior change driver. It's much easier and more sustainable and just long-term future proof and just more powerful to create a situation where the desired behavior becomes the most likely outcome. In a way, you want to make it so that it's just difficult to do anything else. Like it's, a, it's like a funnel or a slide. Your environment, your structure, everything is leading you towards it. So I want you to imagine something like this. You you need to study when you need to study and this is like an idealistic situation but I'm just I'm just using this to prove a point right you need to study when you need to study you leave your house and you enter into your study room which is a separate building outside of your house it's fully soundproof there's white noise playing through the walls so that you're not getting distracted by anything like binaural beats or whatever the lighting is perfect there is a clean, perfect desk in front of you. There is a laptop there and that laptop does not have any games on it. It's a magically built in so that the only things that you can access are things related to what you're studying. And the internet is perfect. There's no buffering time for anything. Your notes are in front of you. You have perfect, you know, stationary everywhere. All your notes are laid out completely open for you to, you know, study. There's no distractions anywhere around you. There's no signal entering into this room. You enter into this room and the door shuts behind you. There's like a water cooler on the side and you're locked in this room for two hours. Maybe there's a nice plant in the corner so you can look at it, it feels really nice. Okay, look, that is an environment where, hey, if you like seriously are gonna procrastinate, you will find something, you'll, you'll count the dust on the desk or something. But there are 
so few distractions and the entire environment is so geared towards getting you to do this behavior that doing the behavior becomes much more likely. If you have that paired with a reward, that is a very powerful combination. Just having the consequence, the reinforcement, the reward alone without having the environment or the structure that allows the behavior to be easy in the first place is not very effective. So overall, I'd say it's half the equation, but it's the least important half of the equation. So it's not quite up to date with the latest in behavioral psychology. This is one of the best and only study methods that actually works for me as a college student with a very short attention span. Okay, so since it's final season, I wanted to share- uh, Based on what she knows about, at least, which is probably based on only the most common things that people talk about, and most of the common things that people talk about are not supported by any real research or evidence, or the research or evidence actually says that it doesn't really work so well. And this is the type of student I work with all the time. They've tried everything that, that's out there and it hasn't worked for them. And that's not because there's something wrong with them. It's because the methods legitimately don't work unless you meet a certain few conditions. And those few conditions mean that they probably weren't struggling that much to begin with. So since it's final season, I wanted to share my favorite study method because I have had no motivation and it's been so hard for me to focus. So my friends and I have been using this method since high school and it makes us so productive and honestly makes studying fun. Okay, so basically you're gonna find a study buddy and go to your favorite cafe or study spot. Then we open up this website called lifeat.io and we like to choose from one of the study spaces they have. We've been doing the Christmas <laughs> ones, but the main thing we use is the Pomodoro timer. You can cool, add actually. it to the toolbar on the side, but basically we set the timer for 20 minutes and we start off by working for 20 minutes straight. So today we worked on a practice exam together. Then after working for 20 minutes, it'll switch to the long break timer and we basically take a break for 20 minutes and play a video game together just because that's more relaxing than scrolling on my phone today we are playing this game called good pizza great pizza it's really fun if we're in a bigger group we usually do like multiplayer games but yeah we basically just alternate between working and playing for 20 minute intervals you can obviously change the length of them but after each round we usually start to gain momentum and then adjust accordingly you can also do this alone but i personally have no self-control so i like having people to keep me accountable the timer on life at also gives you a little tomato after each round you complete so i love that Hmm. Okay, like overall, I don't really have anything bad to say about this. Um, it's like, I think it's great. If you guys want me to, I can go through a dissection in terms of all the individual parts of cognitive science and psychology that, that are working in favor of this technique and why I think it's a good one. But I like, it's honestly gonna be long and probably no one cares. So I'll skip it and basically say, there's a lot of things that are good, that are going for this. The one thing that I would say, and like, it's not a problem unless it's a problem, right? But in my experience, this has been a problem. I do teach a similar kind of thing to most of my students as well. And one of the things I add in there is that in your break time, you want to make sure that you're not doing something in your break time where you know there's a high likelihood that you're going to move beyond the allocated amount of time. So for example, like, okay, so I recently started watching Severance, which is on Apple TV. I just got like a new iPad. So I had three months free Apple TV trial, right? So I was watching this show called Severance, which is so good, by the way. And I definitely would not be able to watch just like 20 minutes of an episode. Like I can't like stop halfway through an episode and watch. Like there's no way that's happening. Uh, and it's the same thing I know with a lot of people and video games. Like if they play a game, they're not gonna stop. And like, if you're this person, you know it. You know you're not gonna stop. You're not gonna stop. Don't trick yourself. So don't pick activities where you know there is a strong incentive for you to like keep pushing through. It's quite hard to do that with games because games are designed to hook you in and, and keep you in. Obviously in a group setting, it's a lot easier because other people are like kind of stopping you. But again, if they get hooked in as well, then everyone is kind of like derailed. I personally think that there are it, like relaxing things that you can do that help you to sort of reset your brain and actually reconsolidate some of that knowledge as well. So something like going for a walk is a really, really good one. And I know that sounds like super boring, not as fun as playing a game, but look, maybe just give it a go. Maybe you can like make it a little bit more fun or something, but there is a cognitive benefit with first of all, just movement and exercise and just even um, like looking at trees and plants and looking outside. In fact, there's even a, a, a relaxing effect that occurs when you look further away and the research is kind of unclear on this and it's a little inconsistent but I personally and this is like purely anecdotal I find that it works for me I think the theory behind this is that when you look out at a further distance it causes the muscles inside your eye to relax because it has to it changes the focal length of your lens and as you relax your eye it also triggers a relaxation response elsewhere as well so if you do this thing where you like take a deep breath in like as, as much as you can and you squeeze your eyes really hard which causes the eye muscles to contract a little bit more even inside your eyeball and then you breathe out and relax and you look further away and you can relax your eyes there's i 
think some research that says that actually it helps to improve relaxation. Again, I don't know how much of a difference it makes, but look, it just, it works for me. Uh, and then going for a walk that can help you relax and actually recover more energy than for example, playing some games. But overall, this is probably one of the better ones that I've seen. Class, here are your exam grades. Man, I failed again. I studied hours. Yes, I went from an F to an A plus. Wow, how did you manage to do it? You know what I love, right? I've had students that have gone from a D to... A, so actually, uh, one of the things I realized, you know, is that the US and like UK, Australia, New Zealand, they have different grading systems. So like an F is like a fail, whereas in New Zealand, Australia, a lot of places, a D is a fail. There's no grade below D, like C minus is 50%. So anyway, I've had people go from like a 50% to like a 75, 85, 90% before. And then people are coming out of the woodwork like, you're a liar, that's not possible. And I'm like, this this is someone who's worked with me, like they've trained and been diligent for months, right? Like, like a, a whole year of diligent cognitive training, working on their study skills and their habits to develop a system that works for them. And they've been able to go from like their 50 to 60% grade average to, uh, you know, an 80 to 95% grade average. And then they're like, nah, that's, there's no way that's possible. Yeah, we've got like a 40 second TikTok. That's like, I went from F to A plus, how did you do it? And it's gonna be like, it's gonna be like, here's a tip you can try that you can probably apply in like 15 minutes. And then everyone's gonna be like, this is amazing. Like, I'm gonna do this straight away. Instead of studying I don't get more, it. but with no results, study less, but more effectively. Anyway, that's good so far. Technique. But that's He's probably right. not the Harvard technique that makes it. it. All yeah. right, teach me. First, yeah. choose an a appeal to authority. Work on it for 25 minutes, take a five minute break, do this four times, and finally take a longer 15 to 30 minute break. Thanks, man. Got any more study tips? Just follow me. Yeah, okay. So, uh, if you're, if you're getting an F and you want to get an A+, Commodore is not the thing that's going to save your life. And you know what? I don't, I'm not even going to try to convince you of that. It's going to help. If you've got issues with staying focused and studying, that's going to help. But this is like not even logical. You, if you're studying a lot and you're not getting great results, rather than using, like the purpose of Pomodoro is to help you to enter into deep focused work. So yes, maybe you're spending like eight hours a day studying, but you're actually only covering what would normally take you four hours. If you were to use something like Pomodoro, which causes a little bit more focus, you would be able to get more output in the same amount of time. Okay, that's good. But if you're studying eight hours and you're failing, and then you get the same amount of work done in four hours, you're still failing. <laughs> you're going from like, the time and effort to achieve a certain output. And so what you're saying, what this guy's saying is reduce the time and effort and be more focused. But actually, if we're reducing the time and effort and being more focused in less time, the result is not really changing. We'd have to actually then compensate to do more. We'd have to be more effective in a shorter period of time and then spend more time to then compensate. If there is a problem with the process, more of it doesn't lead to a better result. The process is usually the thing that is faulty. So the first thing to do will be to examine how we are spending those eight hours. Is the primary issue focus? If you're failing, it's very unlikely that the primary issue is just gonna be focus. And if you do get better focus, you might go from an F to a D. If we figure out the, the method of learning and the actual process that we are using during that time, and then we apply something like this, that is gonna be much more effective. But this doesn't really make sense. And again, it's that really classic over-promising, which I, I really hate. And again, like, you know, I, I know that it's always about, it's just like, it's a, it's a clickbait game, right? Like, I'm on social media, like, I know it, I get it. I get the clickbait game, but like, you can figure out other clickbait ways to hook people in. You don't have to oversell and overpromise things. Just find a way to sell it a little bit more authentically. Don't don't perpetuate the culture and the normative beliefs that people have around how learning is and how to be excellent, where it's making a bunch of people feel even worse. Like there are millions of people out there that are doing the blurting or the you know flashcards and the Pomodoro, and they're doing it until their eyes fall out and they're still not getting good grades. If you're saying that that's all it takes, then the message they're gonna get for themselves is that I'm not good enough, which is usually just not true. And that's it. We are at the end of all the videos. If there are specific things that you want me to review, uh, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching. If there's things that you want me to go into a little bit more depth, let me know in the comments and I'll try to make a bigger video explaining some of that a little bit more. Uh, if you like these kind of reaction videos, let me know as well. But thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.